One of my favorite parts of the internet is Usenet. Let's say you're into world travel, or bird watching, or making beer. Or ancient civilizations, or talking about parent-teen relationships, or maybe you're into nude sunbathing. I hoped you weren't going to mention that. But on Usenet, you can read messages from and send messages to people who share your interests, whatever they are. Usenet has thousands of discussion groups on diverse subjects. They're called news groups. Now, you can subscribe to any news group you like. As for me, I'm partial to one on the environment, listed as Sci.Environment, and I get all the messages posted to that group. Let's look at what's waiting for me now. I just click here on my news reader. And you can see there are lots of messages here on the environment. People are commenting on isotope ratios and deep ecology and the conference in Geneva. But here's one from someone who's seeking help on the Northwest forest fires. And he says he's just looking for information. And I can click here and see all the responses. And of course, everybody is putting in their two cents worth. It's pretty interesting to check out what people have to say about these things. You can also post messages to news groups. Keep in mind that posting an internet message is a lot like tacking up a message on a corkboard. Everyone can see it. And on the internet, those people are all over the world. So be prudent. Now here's a news group I like. It concerns telephone systems. It's a little technical, but the stuff can be interesting. So I'll switch here, and I'll click on its name, which is comp.decom, originally data communications, dot telecom. There's a few seconds pause while it goes and reads through the titles of all the lines to make a list of them. And here is a typical question. Someone's wondering how many telephone companies own cross-continental telephone lines, and they have an estimate here. And I can go through and find a few more messages. Now, I actually think I happen to know the answer, that the number of transcontinental telephone lines is 42. Maybe it's right, maybe it's not, but I want to tell everyone. So I'm going to press the post button. I'm going to type in uh, a suitable topic here. And I'll type in my, uh, my response here, which is, I'm sure the answer is 42. It'll automatically add in my signature. I click on the post button. There is a delay of a few seconds while the message is sent out to the network. And as soon as that box goes away, now that message is sent out. And in a few hours, people all over the world will be able to see it. It's as easy as that. One thing you should know is that censorship is not a part of the internet culture. In fact, technically speaking, it's pretty much impossible. That's why the internet might contain some material that seems offensive to you. And it also explains why you might get spammed. Now, spam, as we all know, is a meat-related food product. But on the internet, spamming means sending thousands of copies of the same message to people all over Usenet. Now, some people have done it in the mistaken belief that it's an effective way to advertise. But take it from me, it's not. So because there's no censorship, you may find some news groups devoted to topics you'll find offensive. And the easy answer to this is just don't read them, or at least don't look at their pictures. But the vast majority of news groups offer a wonderful way to communicate with people all around the world on nearly every conceivable topic. This communication can even have some influence on history. For example, when Russian officials attempted a coup against President Gorbachev in 1991, the internet played a crucial role in thwarting it. The plotters struck while Gorbachev was on vacation. They hoped to expand their limited support by controlling the flow of information to the West, and particularly to the Russian people. They censored the news in most Russian media and restricted phone links to the West. Television was reduced to playing just operas and old movies. But the plotters forgot about a Russian computer network named Relcom. Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev is now on vacation. He is undergoing treatment. It was kind of, you know, when you see TV uh, going up with all those faces uh, reminding uh, Stalinist ministers, it's kind of a chilly feeling, like a flashback to the past. Some Yeltsin's helpers were running around the city uh, trying to find uh, photocopiers. The first piece of paper we got was the first decree by Yeltsin, and we simply typed it in, uh, sent it to, to the network, and uh, made copies they wanted uh, when we got quite a lot of requests for more information from people on the net. Uh, 
we contacted uh, Yeltsin's people and asked them to, to provide us uh, regular information. Vadim was glad to hear from friends in the West who wanted to help. One was a California professor who used the internet to contact RELCOM. They asked me to just summarize the news as we were seeing it in the West. So I listened to the radio and every couple hours I would make a summary, type that as an email message, and then send that to RELCOM. And then they would circulate it within the Soviet Union. And at the same time I was doing that, a colleague, Jonathan Gruden, was in Denmark at the time, and he was doing the same from that point of view. Ordinary Russians also provided eyewitness reports to the engineers and technicians at RELCOM. These stories, along with the Western media reports, began to provide a steady stream of information to people across the Soviet Union. RELCOM workers also posted the decrees of Boris Yeltsin, even though Russian media was mostly silent about Yeltsin's defiance. Basically, uh, people who plan the coup were expecting that as soon as they say the mass media, they will create impressions they already won, and regional officials will line up to swear allegiance to them. Now, by providing alternative information, we uh, made it clear that uh, the question is still not decided who is on the top. President Gorbachev returned to Moscow and overcame the coup attempt. And the extraordinary reform movement that led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union survived.